glad to have you online with us tonight. We hope you're all keeping well and safe throughout this whole entire pandemic. Now, my name is Shah. I'm going to be your host for tonight. Just a little background on information on us. We have been organizing educational conferences for traders since 2009. And we have organized nearly 50 events since then in various venues, including Asia and Europe. Our goal is to educate traders of all levels. At our events, we combine educational part from lectures to workshops alongside with numerous prize draws and contests. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, enjoy the video, our opening video for today. Stay tuned. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have enjoyed the video. Moving on to the next formality for this evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Pavel, the Business Development Director and the General Sponsor for this event, one of the pioneers among retail brokers, Instaforex. The company has started its journey in the market on 2007, and, th and I think Pavel will like to elaborate on the company's achievements throughout these years. Mr. Pavel, please. Hi, Sean. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to see you again and a uh, huge pleasure to speak in front, in front of such an audience. And guys, I'm sure uh, that you have come not to listen to me, but listen to Alist Alistair, so I will try to be very, very short. But I really have to say a couple of words about our company. And my main message is for people who don't really know much about InstaForex. So as Shah have correctly said, we are on the market since 2007, and this is really a big advantage. Not because uh, it gives us an image of reliable broker, broker which is 13 years on the market, but also because we have actually developed so much on the, for these 13 years that it's really, really hard to find anything that we don't have, yeah, for the traders. So Forex, cryptos, binary options, CFDs, metals, indexes, yes, we have it. High and low leverages, solutions for investors, social trading, we also have it. So actually, uh, uh, actually, when you finish the uh, listening to webinar, and if you will try to find everything you want to find on our website, and, uh, and if you will not be able to find anything, I will uh, provide you uh, in the chat a, 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 an email uh, where in case you will uh, contact us, uh, please, uh, we, I will be happy to answer any of the questions I or my team. And almost forgot, we have a lot of bonuses, but for this special event, we have prepared also a special 70% bonus which is not available for, uh, for general customers, only for the guests of this webinar. And this, uh, and this uh, bonus will be available in the very end of the webinar. But before it, I will see you in about an hour to hold the exciting contest with fancy prices. And I guess that's all from, from my side for now, Sha. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Pavel. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, our speaker for the evening, Mr. Alista Crooks. He's the head trader and trainer at um, Traders Support Club in London, UK, with over, over 18 years of experience. Let me just get this right. He has worked with some top forex and commodity traders in UK and US. Alista has helped all types of traders at all levels ditch their bad habits 
and to realize how to approach trading correctly, step over their emotional hurdles and grow their accounts in a very, cons very consistent way. Alista is also the co-author for book Madness of Money and is one of the UK's most sought after trading coach and mentor. He's also one of the most popular speakers at Show Effects World events. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, Mr. Alista. The stage is yours. Go. Can you hear me okay, guys? Have I got sound? Am I coming through? Yes. Just give me a sound check. Wonderful. Good. Okay, so I'm going to get started, guys, because there's a lot of information that I want to cover with you today. So the first thing I want to do is say that I hope you're all safe and well. And despite what is going on, this is a wonderful time to be in the markets. It may not be a wonderful time globally with everything that's going on, but the advantage of trading, as you all well know, is you don't have to go anywhere to be able to do it. So as I said, I hope you're safe and well. We've got about 90 minutes together now, so I want to come in as much information as I can during this time. And I'm really excited. And the reason why I'm excited is normally when I'm working with Show FX, I'm doing a live event and I'm able to see you face to face live. Okay. Now, obviously, we can't do that, but here's the great thing about today is today you are literally sat in my trading room. So, although you're over where you are, you are literally sat looking at this screen here. And the great thing about that is we are going to be able to go through some live examples of what I'm teaching and actually show you a couple of live trades. So I hope you're really excited about that as well, because one of the most important things when you're learning anything new is the ability to be able to apply it. Now, obviously, I can't teach you everything in a two hour period. But what I can do is take a huge amount of the learnings that I have from the last 18 years and actually apply those to you today. Okay, now, first of all, just quickly remember any examples that I show you are for educational purposes only. It's really important that you understand that I am not making any trade recommendations. There will be a chance for you to ask questions during the whole of today's presentation, which will really, really help you. So when we do the questions, I'll put my, I'll put my uh, camera back on so you can see me answer that. All right. And remember, any decisions you make to trade in any form of uh, financial instrument are done under your own risk. All right. So today, the su subject of today's training is why 80% of traders fail and how you listening to the presentation today don't become one of them. But the challenge is, is so many traders are without realizing doing the wrong thing. And ultimately, it comes down to two main reasons. They're not getting feedback from somebody who's got experience. And number two, what they're doing is trying to do everything on their own. So with that, having that experience and that feedback, and then combining that with too many information sources. So the reason I can say that is because I've made pretty much every mistake possible. But then what I've realized is that I needed to get help from somebody. So early on in my trading career, about 18 months in, after losing a bunch of money, I decided to get help. And I got a trading mentor from the States, a guy who lived in Louisiana. And that made a big difference to me. So as I've said, I've been trading 18 years. I'm one of the UK's top trading mentors. It says there I've got 18 years worth of real time experience and 12 years worth of coaching experience. You see that picture on the right down at the bottom? That was me in a live trading conference where I was trading my own money. Now, this is something really important. Of 34 educators in Europe, there was only two educators that were willing to actually trade their money live at that event. And that tells you a lot about who is out there. And it tells you a huge amount about the fact that there are a lot of people teaching trading, but they're not 
actually willing to put their money behind it. So every single strategy that I trade and every strategy that we sell at Traders Support Club, which is my training company, we I have at least six figures in UK sterling behind it. So I have at least a hundred thousand pounds behind any of the strategies that I trade. I also now I'm a regulated fund manager, so I actually have my own fund. And the same thing applies there as I have six figures of my own money behind the trades that I place in my own fund. I've traded around the world, as I've said, and I specialize working closely with people in my trading room because this, like you're seeing now, this is where I spend a lot of my time. This morning, I did a two hour session with a group of our traders, and then tonight, I'm doing a live training with probably 25 of our professional members. And the reason I'm telling you that is because after doing that for the best part of 12 years, you start to see patterns in the way people think, the way people learn, but most importantly, the way people trade. And you don't have to be a genius to know and see where traders can change. But the trouble is, is a lot of traders, even if they have knowledge about a particular indicator or a particular strategy, they don't have the self-awareness to be able to see where they're going wrong. And this is where me and my team come in. So I'm going to share a lot of that with you now. So this is the first thing that I want you to write down. So please take notes as I'm going through today. Okay. So this is the first thing that I want you to write down is trading and successful trading comes down to two concepts and all traders will have an issue in either one of these areas it will be a skill set issue so they don't know how to manage risk correctly or they don't know how to apply support and resistance to a chart or it will be that they have a mindset issue so they know the technicals but when it comes to the fact that they've had three losing trades they suddenly break all their rules so what you have here is you have two distinct areas. And in fact, after coaching, as I've said, hundreds of traders live in my trading room, most traders have an issue in both areas. But the way traders go about trying to solve this means they can go round and round in circles for ages without achieving what it is they want to achieve. Now, a lot of traders, when you speak to them, think that their problem lies in one of these areas, that they need more and more information. The information that they've got isn't sufficient, so they need more. Okay. Now, that can be the case in some scenarios, but it is really important to understand that very often it's actually changing the information they use or looking at it in a different way. A lot of traders just consume too much information and then aren't able to have a clear strategy on what to do. Another one is they often think that the indicator will be the solution. Three, hear this a lot, that they need a better broker. Well, at this conference today, you've got access to one of the best brokers, InstaForex. So you can go out there and actually be using one of the best brokers who've been around for a long time. So that excuse isn't valid. You will be able to access a great broker, but too many traders use this as an excuse. Now, these factors, and this is important, these factors can contribute to a trader's lack of success, but they are not the determining factor. So very often, these might have a small percentage impact on the trader being successful, but in fact, they spend too much time focused on it. So they spend 80% of the time focusing on things that will have 20% of, Im of impact, and they spend only 20% of time focusing on the things that will have 80% impact. Because the things that will have an 80% impact on your success are often the things that are harder to do. So we're going to go through that very shortly and show you what things to focus on. But I want you to be aware of these traps or these hurdles that you can see there, these hurdles that traders can fall over and fall over on a regular basis. So number one you'll see here is the, I call this the blessing and the curse of YouTube. Okay. So YouTube is a great resource. I would be lying if I said that it wasn't a great resource, something that we probably use all the time. 
the challenge when it comes to trading and using YouTube is there is so much information out there that you can end up taking on too much information and never actually finding a solution. The other thing with YouTube is the problem of context. And what I mean by context is that a lot of what you're learning might work for the person that is showing you that. But the challenge with that is they might be trading a certain market and might be using a certain strategy and risk profile that is completely different to you. So what happens is you end up following that piece of advice, but you don't understand the context by which that advice is being given to you. So it works for the person on the video showing it to you, but it doesn't necessarily work for you. And then ultimately the challenge with YouTube is you then can't ask that person questions. So the challenge is then, if it doesn't work for you, but it's working for them, you're unlikely to be able to get feedback from them to know where it's going wrong. And also, sometimes the information that's going up on YouTube comes from a good trader, but doesn't come from a good coach, because not all good traders make good coaches. I have friends who are really good traders, but aren't very good at coaching. Now, my fundamental belief is that your tr co-trader coach or your coach has to be trading, but just being a good trader is not enough. And then here, free can be good, but it's not good enough, as I've just said there. Now, on to the second one. Every time I speak anywhere in the world, anytime I talk to a, an audience like I'm talking to you today is there will always be somebody that thinks that they need a different indicator or a different tool to put on their chart that will make the difference. And the, what it says there, the next indicator won't save you is it may impact your trading for 20%, but invariably it's not the issue. Now there are certain tools that are better than others. And I'm going to go through the ones that I use and my team use and my successful traders use. But the challenge with blaming an indicator is it stops you looking at yourself and you're blaming something external to you. And very often it's not the indicator that's the issue, but it's how you use it or how accurately you stick to your rules based on the results of the trades you've just had. All right. The other thing about indicators is very often they are designed in a very complex way and they talk about the indicator in a very complicated, they use a lot of maths, they use a lot of terminology and the risk is that the new trader thinks, well, it must work because it sounds complicated. When in fact, when you see the tools that I use, they are very, very simple, but what is more complex is the level of depth I go in. So you don't need complex indicators to be a successful trader, but you have to understand simple concepts in a complex way. So be wary of something that sounds very complicated. And then often what they're doing is designing that so you buy into it when actually you don't really know whether it's any better than anything else. And remember that an indicator is just a mathematical form of the price that you see on the chart. So any indicator is just a mathematical form of that. So the first and most important priority, which we're going to talk about very shortly, is that you focus on price. And most people who have bought an indicator or use an indicator, and even if that's because they think by it being complex, it's got more chance of working, most people haven't taken the time to test those indicators in live conditions. So they don't actually know, again, whether or not that indicator works for the specific type of trading they are doing. And it helps create the holy grail mentality. Now that isn't a good thing. So a lot of people will use an indicator for a three month period and then they will change and go to another indicator because it didn't give them the result they wanted or they didn't give it enough time to apply it or they applied it in the wrong conditions. And I've seen traders that jump from Fibonacci one month to RSI the next month and then they use something 
they use a grid system the month after and they never actually stick at anything and what they're doing is they're go always going after the holy grail the one thing or the one indicator that will make the difference and invariably that is not going to be the defining factor and then lastly, when I talk about, I've touched on this with brokers, like I've already said, you've got a wonderful broker with an amazing track record that you can access here today. So there is no reason to use that as an excuse. So the excuse of my broker's not very good or I need a better broker, you can get rid of that as of today. Um, things like this, people will say that the broker slips me. So I didn't get out, it didn't get me out at the price I want, but a lot of people won't be bearing in mind the size of the spread when they do that. They tend to generalize about brokers. And then what happens is they, they think the broker is out to get them. Now, this is something very important. Every successful trader that I have worked with, that I have taught, traders that have been successful that I have met, and my good friends, successful traders, when we meet up, none of us sit there having a discussion about how the broker is out to get them. Yet there are loads of videos on YouTube about people talking about brokers doing things like stop hunting and purposely hunting people's stops and limit orders and getting them out of trades. When what I've noticed is the people that moan about this are always the traders that aren't successful. If you speak to any successful trader, they might have the odd challenge with a broker, but they are not sitting there moaning about brokers. So brokers, YouTube, and indicators are not the answer most traders fail because they are not doing the following they are not using discretion with a strategy which we're going to talk about very soon they are too concerned with the trade that they're in winning and don't get me wrong how many of you here just give me a yes in the box just so i know you're there how many of you here like a winning trade those of you that have traded before how many of you love a winning trade of course we do don't we I had a winning trade yesterday, I'm gonna show you. So we all like a winning trade, but most traders are too concerned with the fact the trade has won or lost, rather than what was the risk to reward on the winning trade? So did you win way more than you risked? And did you follow a process to actually get to that point? So it's really, really important that you focus on the development of your process and not on winning. Most traders are not accumulating the right data. They are not collecting the right data and they're not, they're not using that to improve their trading. And then lastly, they don't know the things that trigger them to break their rules. So discipline. Most traders know they should be disciplined, but so many traders will break their rules and won't follow along with what they need to be doing. So we're going to examine how you can improve in each of these areas so you don't end up being one of that 80%. So the first one that we're going to talk about is combining strategy and discretion. Okay. Now what this essentially means is there are two elements to your analysis process that get you to the point where you decide to place a trade. Most traders either overcomplicate this or don't spend enough time getting it right. So we're going to spend a little bit of time today working on this. Now, the definition for discretion is not doing what you like when you like, but it is where a trader uses a series or set of technical tools to establish a specific market condition. Okay. So I will use the same set of analysis tools to establish one of three market conditions and then that will allow them to then trade the relevant strategy to fit that condition so this is the first part of your analysis process which is establishing as it says there where we are on the chart and i'm going to show you this with a live trade that we had yesterday that myself and all our pro members closed out so the first thing i will do is I will always have a time frame where I will be placing the trade. So most of the time I will be placing my trades on a daily chart or a four hour chart. I won't be going any lower than that. So what that means is if I'm analyzing the position of that market, 
I will do that on the daily, the weekly, and the monthly chart. So I'll do that on the daily, the weekly, and the monthly. So I will establish where that market is in relation to it, where it's been on higher time frames than where I will actually trade. So my analysis is always done on a higher time frame. So that's how I will do it. Then as it says here, the first thing I will do when I'm doing that analysis is I will establish key levels of support and resistance. And those of you that come into my trading room going forward, you will learn a very, very specific process for that. I will show you it today. But those of you that are really serious about doing this, I'll show you a process. I will also use trend lines. So I will use that in combination with support and resistance. I will also define the market position. And at that point, without using fancy indicators, without using moving averages, and without using MACD, which are the only other two indicators I use, without doing that, I will then define where the market is and I will then determine whether it's in one of these conditions. So I ask myself the question, where is this, this market we're looking at? Is it in a with the trend condition and against the trend condition, or are we in what we call a trend line break condition? Now, most traders have heard of these, and we're gonna look at an against the trend condition very shortly, but, this is one that can add a huge amount of success and profit to your trading because that is a certain condition that we use on a regular basis. Okay. Now, once I've determined that condition, what I am then able to do is very easily determine the right strategy that fits the condition. So I choose the strategy that fits the condition. So if I look at market X and I'm staring at market X and I've done my analysis and I've seen that when I look at my weekly chart, that market is close to previous resistance. Like you can see here. All right. If I establish that that market is an, in and against the trend scenario in this area here, then I will only look at strategies that I have for against the trend trades. I won't use with the trend setups. No, I use standard charts, Wolfgang. I use standard charts. I don't use anything complicated. So standard use, just standard weekly charts. I'll talk about times that I look at in a second. So what most people will do is they will go up time frames, but have the wrong perspective. You'll see this very shortly. All right. So where most traders go wrong, how many of you here have heard that trading against the trend is a risky thing to do? Has anybody heard that as one of those trading terms that gets put up on Instagram and Facebook or so-called experts tell you? Has anyone heard that before? Just give me a yes in the, in the chat box if you have heard that phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is where so many traders go wrong. Last year, I made seven, just under 70%, 68.8% return, and all of my trades were against the trend. So the challenge is somebody will hear that and they won't trade it, but the reason people say that is because most people trade against the trend when the market is in a trending zone. Give me a yes if that makes sense. So most people, it is risky because they're not doing what I'm teaching you here. They are not going through an overall market analysis process and they're not first before they do anything else determining where they are on the chart. This is something so simple. And recently, I've had one of my traders, he's now turned full time. So he's literally gone full time in the last couple of weeks. And for three years, he was launching videos on YouTube, going around in circles. When he understood this, he was good at everything else, but he hadn't 
understood this. He said this was the difference for him is if he's going to trade a pullback setup or a with the trend strategy, it must be in an area where the market is optimal for trading that. Now, that doesn't guarantee a win, but what it certainly does is it shifts the probability more in your favor. Now, really important point, please make a note of this one, is if a trade is in no man's land or a choppy condition, okay? So if I'm in no man's land or a choppy condition, I'll come to your questions in a second. If I'm in no man's land or a choppy condition, what I will do in that scenario is stay away from the market. Now, it's interesting you've asked about news. So a lot of people will look at this too simplistically and they'll say, if a market is range bound, they will trade against the trend down here. And then through this gap here, they will trade with the trend. But the challenge is, is very often what that's happening slap bang in the middle of the chart is the market is choppy. Give me a yes if you can see the blue there. Okay, so the challenge with something like that is they will say, ah, but it's not in and against the trend condition, it's between the two, that's a with the trend condition. But the challenge is, is the price action is actually choppy. It's not sideways, it's choppy. And then what they'll do is they'll trade up with the trend pullback and then they'll lose. And then they'll trade another one and they'll lose. So very often the middle area of a chart is actually the most dangerous. And I see with the trend traders give back all of their profits simply because they have not acknowledged what the price action is doing in that area. So this is where the skill of doing this over time. And very often, when you have big news, well, I don't trade news. If there's news on and there's big news on, the last thing that I am doing is going anywhere near my charts. I think trading news or trying to trade news is suicide. Now, I've had trades that have, as a result of the news have ended up being a winner more quickly than normal. I've had trades that as a result of the news have been a loser more quickly than normal. When I talk about data, a little bit later today, I'll show you why news is something to stay away from. And too many traders are essentially gambling by trading news. And very often, before big news comes out, the market does exactly what I'm showing you here, which has become choppy. Yeah. So for me, people call um, support and resistance lines, um, they call them areas of value, like you've said, Wolfgang, they call them... Um, all sorts of things like supply and demand. I really don't care what it's called. Too many traders are concerned with what I call name dropping and don't actually know how to use the thing relevant to their own type of trading. So a lot of people know a lot of names for stuff, but don't actually know how to use them. Does that make sense to everyone? So really, really important that, yeah, name, the, the name of something means nothing, means absolutely nothing. I remember once I was at an expo and these two people were almost having an argument on a, or a competition. Who, who knew how many different candle patterns there were? Who's heard of Steve Neeson? Has anyone here heard of Steve Neeson? The guy that, the guy that brought candlesticks to trading. Has anyone heard of him? I was speaking at a conference with Steve and I asked Steve how many candlestick patterns of all the thousands of candlestick patterns that you've written books about, how many do you trade? And he said four. So candlestick patterns don't mean a huge amount. Okay. They have their purpose, but most traders use them in completely the wrong way. So if you're not getting this bit right, your candle pattern means nothing. All right. So this is the fundamental thing. And I've just had six new traders join my trading room. And all they are doing this week is sending me 20 markets where they're drawing in their levels. So all they're doing is showing me that they can find the key levels on their chart, because this is a skill that needs practice. So but you must establish before you take any trade, what 
condition you are in based on the market position. All right. So let, we're going to look at this live in a second, and I'll show you a I'll show you a trade from yesterday. So we'll come back to that in a second. But first, let's define what a strategy is, okay? Now, a strategy, and I'm going to give you an analogy in a second, a strategy is a repeatable set of criteria that have been tested, and this is the most important bit, that have been tested and proven to give you an edge over a specified period of time in the specific market condition. So I won't test against the trend strategies unless I am in and against the trend condition. And every single strategy that I trade and every strategy that we teach any of our students, day or swing in Traders Support Club, are all tr tested. So we go back and test past data and they've been traded live for at least one year before any student is allowed to trade them themselves because we want the proof that that strategy works. Give me a yes if that makes sense to everyone. Now, what a lot of traders will do is they will buy what has been told to them is a tested and proven strategy. The challenge is a lot of strategies that are sold on the internet are tested on a demo account, which doesn't necessarily work quite the same as a live account. So a lot of strategies that say they are tested and proven have only been tested on a demo account. And the challenge is, is a lot of traders will make this mistake. They'll say, well, the strategy that I use is tested and proven. And I then ask them, have you done some testing yourself? And most traders will say no. Have you seen the trade live and seen other traders live first? And they will say no. So even though at Traders Support Club, all of our strategies have been tested for a minimum of five, some are 20, and have been traded live for a year, some of our students come in and trade strategies that we've been trading live successfully for nine years. I still get them to do some testing themselves. Their normal reaction in that scenario is, but if you've tested it, why do I need to? Well, part of testing your strategy is so you get good at seeing it which another term for that is pattern recognition. Now, I'm going to give you a live example in a moment, but before we look at this in combination, I want you to think about this analogy. So I want you to imagine, all of you, that you are heading towards a train station and you've all got a train that you want to get on and you want to get on that train and it's going to take you to your destination. Give me a yes if you're following so far. So I want you to really imagine it, all right? Now, for you to get on the right train, you have to find the right platform. So you've got to find the right platform. But you'll only know which platform to go to if you look on the departures board and find the platform for your train that is going to your destination. We all understand that, don't we? So imagine if you walk into the train station and you guess which platform to get on, yeah? Let's say you guessed which platform to get on and you went to platform five. If you're on platform five and a train pulls up at platform five, how many of you know that you've got to press the button and walk onto the train and sit in a seat? How many of you can do that? Well, all of you can, can't you? All of you can stand on a platform, press the door, step onto the train, step onto the seat. The problem is, is you could be on the wrong what? What? You, can, you know how to get on the train, but if you could be on the wrong what? The wrong platform. And, uh, and therefore on the wrong train, Nico. Yeah. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? So just because you know how to get on the train doesn't mean you're going to get on the right train. And I want you to think about, before we look at this live example, I want you to think about this idea of discretion and strategy. This bit is you getting on the train. That's you pressing the button, the door, stepping onto the train and sitting in the seat. Most people can follow a strategy that is given to them. 
But what most people don't take the time to do is walk into the station, work out where they are, where they want to go, and which platform they need to be on. Most people skip this bit and go straight to the strategy and just think if the, if the guru, if the guy online, if I can just work out a simple A, B, C to enter a trade, most strategies are really just a reliable way to enter a trade. If you can combine that by getting on the right train and finding the right area, then that's going to help you. All right. So how many of you are up for looking at a live example from yesterday? Let's go and have a look at this in action. I'm actually going to show you a couple because I'll show you the one, the trade that I took, and then we'll look at the other one. So can everybody see down the bottom? There is a trade here on New Zealand dollar, Canadian dollar. That was a sell trade. There. Can you see that? Just give me a yes. I'll come to that. I'll answer questions on this section in a minute. So I'm going to go through this, then I'll answer questions. So New Zealand dollar, Canadian dollar. Okay. Now, remember, do I just, do I get on the train first or do I work out the right platform? Which do I do first? Platform. So this trade, okay, the, the getting on the train bit happens on the four hour chart. And there are a certain set of criteria, which I'm going to show you in a second. Okay. So can everybody see that I am looking at a weekly chart just here? Just look up the top. It's a weekly chart. Now, remember, what did I teach you a minute ago? That if you are going to trade off of the daily or the four hour, you've got to establish where the price is on a lower or higher time frame. Which one? Can anyone remember what I said? Great, on a higher time frame. So we've been traveling up in this market all this time since March. Give me a yes if you can see that. Now remember I said, what do I use to establish where we are on the chart? I establish support and resistance levels. Can you see those in blue? So one here a re resistance becoming support. And I also use trend lines. Can you see the white line there? Good. Now, I'm simplifying it slightly. Those of you that come forward with us will learn this strategy in more detail. But remember, I trade against the trend. So if I'm going to trade against the trend, I have to be an area where there is a higher probability of a move in that direction. Give me a yes if that makes sense. Good. Now, I'm also aware that there is a level here because I might be wrong at this point. So now I go down to the daily chart and all I'm doing is I now know which platform. So for the last week and a half, I've been waiting for this resistance level to be hit. So once we're at this resistance level, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I don't just get on a train anywhere. I'm only getting it on the train at this point here. Okay. So I'm going to go down to the four hour chart. Now we come in and give me a yes if you can see that we hit that level right there. And this is really important because you don't have to have tons of experience to be able to see that. Okay. So this now means that my discretionary analysis process is over. Everything that I've wanted price to do has happened once that level gets hit. I now move over to the strategy criteria. And all I do at this point is wait to see or automate it through an automated algorithm, which we have. All I wait is for a certain set of criteria to happen, which didn't happen until this point here. 
which was essentially nearly six o'clock UK time on the 13th. Okay, now look. I'm going to talk about risk and everything else a little bit a little bit later. But this trade, can everybody see the red area? That was my risk and that was my short trade. And that was a three to one winner in less than a day. Who'd be happy with one of those a couple of times a week? Now, the important thing to remember, if you look at this chart, is were there other periods, if you look here, were there other periods where price came down? Yes or no? Are there other periods here where price came down? Yes or no? Yeah. And this is where traders go wrong. So traders go, oh, I'm going to go against the trend here. I'm going to go against the trend here. But the problem here is, is they haven't got an overall market position. So I don't care about that, care about that or this one because I care about it once it does what I need at the right place. Now let's flip this now and look at another trade that a lot of that I'm not in, but a lot of our students are in because this is a really important point that I want you to make a note of. Some traders are really good at trading against the trend. That is natural for them. Okay. I'm one of those people. I see those setups more easily. Some traders, what's really natural for them is to trade with the trend. Okay. So some traders, it's more natural for them to trade with the trend. Yeah. And that's patience of excellence. Totally. And that's the difference. People think learning about technicals is the skill wolf gang. It's not. It's about patience. Most successful traders use a much more simple process than you think. The money is selling students complicated processes, but that's not what trading's all about. So some traders are actually good at trading both with the trend and against the trend. So some traders are good at both. Okay. A lot of traders will start with one and then move on to the other. Where do you think most traders do go wrong? Where do you think most traders go wrong? When they start out, have a guess guys. Where do you think most traders go wrong when they start out? Most traders go wrong when they start out because they try when they start out to do both at once. And what happens is they're trying to look at too many markets and too many different scenarios and they end up missing trades or getting the trade in the wrong position. So the market is in a trending position and they end up trading against the trend or the market is in against the trend position and they end up trading with the trend. And the reason why, ultimately why they're doing both is because they've got a greed based mindset, which we'll talk about later. However, can everybody see here that this market, I've also got a couple of resistance levels in. Can you see the blue lines here? Just give me a yes, guys, if you can see the blue lines. Okay. Now, are with the trend traders are currently, and they've just got long yesterday on this particular pair here because they are trading this long because we are not at a resistance level. So the, re the with the trend traders are trading this one long and their view is to trade it up to this level take half profits and then they're going to trade it up to this level after that. And that's the particular strategy. But this is the important lesson that I want you to have is the with the trend trader and the against the trend trader can both have the same resistance and support levels on. But what happens is the decision making process that the against the trend trader makes 
is they do nothing until this level is reached. Whereas the with the trend trader can acknowledge the same levels, but what they will do is if their trade sets up in between those levels with the right characteristics and not slap bang in the middle where so many with the trend traders go wrong, is they will then trade. And if you think about this, the with the trend traders reason for getting out is the same level that the against the trend trader is using to potentially get in. So can everybody see that the skill of getting good at finding supply and demand levels, support and resistance, areas of value, I don't care what you call it. What is important is getting good at finding these levels because it doesn't matter whether you trade with the trend or against the trend, those levels still apply to you, but just in different ways. Okay, so any questions specifically on what I've covered so far? All right, so uh, before we move on to the, the question and answer, just a very quick note to the audience, during your Q&A, please write in the chat to all participants and not only to the uh, panelists. Because uh, what you need to do is you need to change your setting because we want everyone to see the question, not just under all panelists. And also just bear in mind, the more interesting your question is, you might just walk away with the price. So stay tuned for that. So in the meantime, any questions at all, please go on and just type it out right now. Okay, so um, there was actually a question right before. Can we scroll the chat up? Uh, let me just read out the question for Alista first. The, the very first question that was asked, let's see if you want to address this. Do you or did you use point and figure charts for W or monthly time frames? That was a question. Yes, great. Thank you, Shah. Yes, no, I don't. So personally, the only difference between, and I can show you this live, the only difference between my uh, daily chart and my weekly chart, well, I'll let you, let you guys confirm to this. It's a great question. My daily chart has the same indicators on, moving averages. My weekly chart has the same indicators on. My monthly chart has the same indicators on. So the reason I do that is it keeps things very, very simple. Okay, it keeps things very, very simple. And the reason why I wanna keep it simple is I wanna be able to track the effectiveness of what I use. So too many traders are using so many different things that when you add up the number of variables, they won't be able to track their process and they won't know if a certain element in their process is causing them to lose. So for me personally, I keep all of my charts exactly the same regardless of time frame. Now I might use, I might look for my strategy set up on the four hour and I use the, the daily and the weekly to look for my levels. My day traders who don't work directly with me, they work directly with my day trader Kerry, they will use the four hour and the hourly to find their levels and trade off of the five. But their charts will essentially look the same on each level. All right, so good. Okay, so the next question I see is by Benny. When there is big news, is there a special way to handle it? Good question. And I touched on this briefly, but I'll touch on it again. The, the best way to handle big news is to stay away from it. So if you are a swing trader like me, then I will either be in a trade and the news happens or I'll be flat. So I won't have a trade in the market at that point. So for me as a swing trader, if I'm already in a trade, then I'm not going to exit that trade or do anything because news results are only obvious after the time. And I hear traders saying, oh, I should have got out of my trade. I knew I was going to do that. Well, no tra very few traders actually quantify whether the news impacts their results. So for me, if I was a swing trader, I'm in. Now, what we tell our day traders is if there's a significant news announcement coming up like non-farm payrolls or, um, 
uh, uh, oil oil levels or manufacturing in the UK or European ECB announcement, then if it's close to that time, then the goal for them is to not trade during that time. So wait till after the news, because very often the, new, the reaction to news when it's over and done with, I think it's like 70% of markets continue moving the same way within a three hour window after news. I can't remember the exact stat. So the best thing you can do when there's big news announcements as a day trader is stay away. If you like golf or like the gym, head there when the bigger news announcements are happening. Because very often what you'll get is prior to the news announcement, the market goes quiet anyway, or it dips up and spikes based off rumors. And that's naive retail traders trying to catch a move ahead of time. But often those, those, those rumors are designed for people to jump in early and then the market will clip them the other way anyway. So stay away when it comes to news. Okay, the next question I can see from Nico is, uh, how do you develop a strategy? Good question. So the way to develop a strategy is decide, number one, whether you want to be an against the trend trader or with the trend trader. So decide on that first because you only want to focus on one of the two. And then once you've done that is prior to that, you will be only looking in certain levels, like I've already said. So you only focus on certain points. So if you're against the trend trader, you want to be at support and resistance levels. If you are a with the trend trader, essentially in between. And then think about only having two or three variables that you want to use. Now, the first and most important variable is whether you want to be, and we'll use a with the trend example, whether you want to be a what we call a change of direction trader, where if you were trading long and you wanted to make money to the upside here, if you were trading long in this scenario here, then what you would do is say, okay, I like to trade when there is a change of direction. So even though I want to trade long, I want to make sure the market is going from down to up when I enter. So that's what's called, we call that a COD. So do you want to trade as a change of direction? Or as I'm drawing here, would you rather trade what is known as a continuation? A continuation or another word for that is a breakout. So are you going to trade what we call pullbacks where there is a change of direction on your entry and then or do you want to trade breakouts, which is just a continuation? If you want to trade uh, change of directions, then you may start bringing in candle patterns like hammers. You might start bringing in engulfing candles or even what we call directional candle closes and then have no more than about four or five criteria that allow you to get into the trade and then just take your historical chart and test it so go back over a period of time and test whether or not the trade is actually successful so i'll just show you an example of what i mean here so if i just show you i'll just pull up a couple of examples so here all of the strategies that we trade are automatically tested because I don't know whether a strategy is going to work. Somebody can say, do you think this will work, Ali? And I'm like, well, go and test it to see what results you get when you go through and test it. And if you just look here, here is just a folder of back tests of both mine, my team and some of my best students. So can you see all the different strategies that we've tested? So not every single one is successful, but Everything we do, we test first. Does that help, Benny? Good. Next one. Okay, so um, before I address the next question, once again, I'd like to, to tell all everyone to address your question to all panelists and attendees, not just to all panelists, so that everybody can read your question. Now, uh, Alicia, the next question is, can you find the correct support and, res and resistance levels and how? So the way to do it is think about what price has done in the past. So if you look at my euro pound chart here, can everybody see that there is a repeatable area where price has come in and changed direction? Yes, it goes slightly higher as well, but can everybody see that there is a repeatable area just there? So the last time we were here, we changed direction. People overcomplicate this. Last time we were here, we changed direction. Came all the way down here. Last time we were here, we changed direction. 
we've come up here we've changed direction so what that suggests to me is i don't know what will happen it may be that on the fourth hit of that level we break through it okay but i don't want to take that chance so for me what i'm do is doing is the way to think about support and resistance levels imagine they imagine them as brick walls so where did price struggle to get through last time well we can see that it's this area here so what we have is we have room between where we are to that level so if you're with the trend trader you can trade up to that level but once you're here you don't want to rely on the market doing something differently okay so that is essentially where i would then only consider against the trend so use the define a time frame you want to trade off and then use higher time frames to do that all right okay the next question is do we use fib ratio to determine the s and r do i use fibs no i don't now actually i've got two students that do use fibonacci they don't use it for they don't use it for defining support and resistance levels these two students use it to define retracement levels to get into the trade all right one of our other students if i pull up this is a recent market euro yen here and if i go down to the weekly chart can everybody see that we've got an area of support here on the weekly chart Give me a yes if you can see that there. Good. So one of our students uses fibs, not necessarily for support and resistance levels, but uses the retracement levels as targets. One of our students took a trade literally here and ran it to the 38.2% retracement. They had an 18 to 1 trade. Who'd be happy with that? So I'm not saying you can't use them as support and resistance levels, but we keep it simple, use them as target levels or as retracement entries. All right, good. Next one. Okay, so the next one is why are your students long on EURGBP when you're showing your monthly chart? It clearly indicates that it's a, it is a good weight until 0 0.96 and then short. So let me show you, that's the exact reason. So if, think about what I've been teaching you. Am I short Euro, am I short Euro pound? I'm not short Euro pound because I only trade against the trend. So for me to be trading Euro pound, price has to reach those better levels, okay? But if I've got a group of traders who are with the trend, it's if you say it's clearly an obvious area to short well we're not there yet so the option is we still have room to here and then possibly to here and possibly further up before we would consider the short so the reason that you're giving is the exact reason why if you trade with the trend you can be in this trade because there is clean air between where we are now and where the next level is good next one we get a lot of questions coming through right okay the next one is from faisal noor he says i keep changing my strategy depending on the chart trend i can hit the target but at the end i lose how do i fix this stop changing and reacting to what is going on on the chart so stop changing and reacting so for example i've been in a trade i've been in a short trade on euro new zealand dollar and I'll show you this. Can everybody see my chart? I've been in a short trade since all the way up here. If I react every time the price goes against me, that's how I end up losing. Cool. So don't okay. react. Stick to your plan. All right. Okay, so the next question is, um, will you please suggest a book that helped helps to learn candlestick pattern and strategy properly and make a profit. Um, I'm going to be really blunt and say, no, don't use a book. Because if you focus, if you think, if you think about what I'm teaching you, if candlesticks are a tiny element of what you do, they are the last bit 
of your trade. Okay, so if you don't have your overall market analysis, if you don't practice that, you don't have a strategy, then just learning about candlesticks is no good. All right. Now, again, be careful about people recommending stuff here. All right. So a lot of people are typing in recommendations. Be careful who you take a book recommendation from because you don't know the track record of that person. And as I said at the start of the webinar, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have tons and tons of information and all you do is keep going around in circles. No, no, I understand. But all I'm saying here, guys, is this is what people think. They think I need to learn about candle patterns, but it might not be candlestick patterns that you need to look at. Does that make sense, Dasha, who asked the question? Okay, so um, the next question is, uh, we're going to take three more questions and then uh, we're going to move on to the next Great segment. Yeah. The, I've got so much more I want to teach. Oh, there's still more. Um, okay, so three more questions. How to handle the yo-yo market? What, which time frame to follow? It, right. Again, the question is too general. So currently, if I, look, if I show you three markets and we look at euro and we look at euro on a weekly chart, so we look at Euro here, okay? Euro has been very choppy, very yo-yo-y. Can you see it? So it, it's jumping outside of its five high, five low band and then back up. So we've got Euro doing that. We've got US dollar, yen doing the same thing, okay? And we've got pound US dollar doing a similar thing. Just give me a yes, guys, if you can see that on those three charts. Good. So do you think if you take euro, pound, um, yen and US dollar, that you are going to, that is going to make other currency markets yo-yo? Yes or no? It, of course it is, because they're three, four of the biggest currencies. So the skill is when markets are yo-yoing, is not to try and look for a specific time frame to cope with that, is if you are noticing that your strategy is getting less setups, then just relax. So what too many traders do is if a market is yo-yoing, what they try and do is they try and change their approach or find a different, a different time frame. So there is not one time frame that's, that will help you with a yo-yoing market. The best thing you can do is be more disciplined about the trades you place. Um, if, however, you are trading on low time frame markets, so you're trading on a 60, an hourly, or a five minute time frame, you will have seen a lot of markets moving up and then moving down. So we're still getting quite big ranges on days, but the movement over those days is quite abrupt. So if you can't, if your strategy is not working during that period, the best thing you can do is step back and take your foot off your gas. You can't, you can't lose money on trades you don't place. Does that make sense to everyone? You can't lose money on trades you don't place. And the current conditions we're seeing at the moment feel like they're going on forever. But I'm only, as I said, I'm only trading two strategies at the moment because the other two that I would normally trade don't work well in this particular condition. So once the conditions change, I'll trade more. Good. Okay, so uh, I missed out a question from Dexter. He's, he asks, do you think some people are naturally born to be suited for trading and some are not due to their personalities attitude? Great question. Now, I'm not going to answer that fully now because I'm doing a whole section on that. But my answer is nobody that I have met is born natural for trading. All human beings are designed appallingly to be traders. And I'm not going to, and I'll tell you why later. Okay. Uh, last and final question before we move on to the next segment. How deep are you putting your stop losses below support? I only, on one of my strategies, I only put it one point below support and one point above resistance because that's what we've tested. And on another strategy, I'm putting them 10 points above and below because that's what we've tested. So there isn't a one size fits all, but on one strategy, the optimum was only to go one point higher or lower. What we found is we tested it at different levels and it didn't make a lot of difference. 
but on the other strategy being 10 points away actually added another 40 percent return over an 18 month period so that's how we that's how we do it so the the answer to the question is test and find out what works Okay, so uh, we have come to the end of the segment for the question and answers. So uh, stay tuned for more question and answers later. Keep it coming when it's time as we have great prizes to be given away to the most interesting question. In the meantime, I'm going to hand it back to Alistair for part two of his, his uh, seminar. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Let's go. Let's get back on to the slides so you can see the next bit. Good. So now we're going to talk about risk because this is an area that gets overlooked by too many traders and it also gets overcomplicated by too many traders. So all I'm going to do is give you some sim simple principles. Now, some of you who already trade, you may be in a position where you um, know this, but it doesn't hurt. If you've never traded before, these rules are vital for you to be successful. So we're not talking about investing here where you hold stocks for a long period of time. We are talking very, very specifically about trading. So number one, never place a trade without a stop loss. Now, if you know who here, just give me a yes. Who here knows what a stop loss is? Who here knows what a stop loss is? Give me a yes. Who here doesn't know what a stop loss is? Is there anybody that doesn't? And that's okay. doesn't matter if you don't. Okay, Penny doesn't know. No worries. So a stop loss, remember, I can trade two ways. I can either trade in an upward direction or a downward direction. So that recent trade I showed you was a trade where I traded in a downward direction okay so if i'm trading in a downward direction and i'm going short then if the trade was to go up it's not going the way i want give me a yes guys if you're following me on that especially you penny if i'm trading long i want the market to go up so if that market goes down it's going the way i don't want it to go so a stop loss the way to think about it is remove the word stop and just think of it as a trigger loss. So what it does is it triggers an order that if the price goes against you a certain distance, it will get you out. So you're not holding it on and on and on and on and losing more and more money. Same the other way. So you're not holding on. So just think of it as a protection that you place at the start of your trade that does it. Now, how many of you that know what a stop loss is have placed a trade without one? Confession time. How many here know what a stop loss is but have traded without one? Blew your account, yeah. So can you see straight away, no amount of knowing about candles, no amount of knowing about whether something is called something else, so no, that's the wrong name for it. All of that is irrelevant if you haven't got the discipline to use a stop loss. And I appreciate your honesty there, guys, so thank you, Nico. So it's very, very important to understand that even if you did nothing else, always make sure that you protect the downside on a long trade or you protect the downside on a short trade i.e the upside all right so always use a stop loss if you are not doing that everything else is irrelevant okay second rule and i wonder who's ever done this never widen a stop once you're in the trade has anyone done that well you've got a stop you've got a target price starts going against you and you widen it what that is doing is risking more on your account. So never, ever risk more by widening your stop. So number one rule, always have a stop, write that down. Number two, never widen it. Now, most of you guys will be trading through what is called a CFD account. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about how to make sure 
you stay safe within your trades, okay? So the first thing I will do is I will always work out what the balance is of my account. Give me a yes if you understand what I mean. Now the challenge when you trade is if you are already in trades, you are gonna have a balance figure and you're gonna have what's called an equity figure, all right? So whenever I'm working out the risk for my trade, I always use the balance figure, what the actual balance is. I don't take into account any additional equity on a trade that might be in profit. So let's say, it doesn't matter whether it's pounds, euros, Singapore dollars, um, US dollars, doesn't matter what currency, doesn't matter at all. If I've got 10,000 units of currency, I am never going to have more than 2% of that 10,000 at risk. So guys, let's see who's good on the maths. What is 2% of 10,000? 200. So the most I'll ever risk on a trade if I had a 10,000 currency account is 200 units of that currency. If the account was 100,000, which is the minimum that I will trade at, because I want my students to know that I've got money behind what I'm doing, the, the same 2% is now 2,000. Make sense? Good. Is everybody following me? So the, you always work out the cash 2% value before you place the trade. Okay. Now, this is really important. This does not change because you think, if you think the trade's got more chance of winning, don't care. If you had three losers and you're trying to make that money back, you don't change this. So no previous result or what you think will happen will change this. The risk for my trades stays the same. I do not increase the risk for any reason. I don't increase the risk because I've been on a winning run. Is everybody following me on that? So I don't change this based on the result of previous trades or what I think will happen on an upcoming trade. Do we ever know what is going to happen on a trade, guys? Do we ever know? No. We never know what is going to happen. Yet, yeah, it's very easy psychologically to think we do. Good. So then, what I'll then do is, how I then manage my risk on a trade is based on how much I'm risking in terms of points. So let's say I've got a really simple trade, one of our with the trend setups, and the rule is that I tr my goal is to trade that setup up to the previous high, and that becomes my target. Where we are right now is my entry right here, and the rule on this strategy is that I risk half this distance for my stop. So my fail safe penny would go half of this distance below my entry. Is everybody following me in terms of that principle? Now, if that's the rule on this particular strategy, this distance on one trade could be 200 points. The risk on another trade could be 100 points, yeah? So not every trade is going to have the same size stop. So what that means is my stake, which will be measured in um, standard lots, mini lots, or micro lots, is going to be different on every trade. So what I've got to make sure here, everyone, is that when I place the trade, that whatever lot size I use does not take me over the cash to risk. So I must know when I place my trade that I've got no more 
than 2% of whatever my account value is at that time. All right? So you have to make sure, and that's the rule. So never ever risk more than 2% of the cash value, but know that if you've got a different size stop on trades, that, that the size of your lots is going to be smaller or bigger. Whereas a lot of people will just go along and they'll trade one standard lot or one mini lot on every single trade. And what they don't realize is they're risking sometimes four, five, even 6% of their account on any one trade. Now, I've worked with traders that couldn't be successful. They come to me and they weren't using stops. So they have to agree before they work with me in my trading room, they're going to use stops. And they have to agree to be risking no more than 2% on swing trades and our day traders risk no more than 1%. Now, why do you think the day trading percent risk is not 2% but is actually 1%? Can anybody tell me why? Why would the percentage risk on day trading be less? It's only potentially more volatile because your stop's predetermined. No, your stop, no, because remember, the stop size is irrelevant, Dexter. If I've got a 200-point stop or a 100-point stop, I'm just going to have a smaller stake based on that. Makes sense? So if I've got a 200-point stop or 100, it's still the same 2%. When I'm day trading, my stop is actually going to be smaller. The reason why is as a day trader, your trade frequency, the number of trades you place is likely to be higher or lower, guys. You got it. It's likely to be higher. So if you are placing more trades during a day, so as a day trader, you might place in one morning the same number of trades. You might place five trades in one morning and that might be the total number of trades you place in one week as a swing trader. So you trade more, your trade frequency is higher. So the more you trade, the more times you are risking your account. Make sense? And the way I think about it is imagine your account as a bag of gold coins. All right. So if you've got 100 gold coins in your, in your account, each time you go in to place a trade, if you take two gold coins out and you place five trades that morning, you put 10 gold coins at risk. Now, you may get more come back, but what most people are doing is they're not thinking about trade frequency. So make sure you're only ever 2% on swing, 1% on day. And the reason this is so important, tell me, everyone, if you lose 50% of your account value, what return do you have to get just to get back to where you started? hundred percent. So if you risk 10% per trade because you're greedy and you happen to have five losers, it could take you a year just to get back to where you started. Can everyone see that? You want to get a hundred percent return just to get you back to where you started. So risk management, very, very important. It's not exciting, but very, very important in actually becoming successful. So risk management is simple. Most people overcomplicated. The key skill with it is never over leverage. So stick to your 2% as a swing trader, 1% risk on every trade as a day trader. And as I've said there, stick no, no more than 2%. Another thing I see people do, has anybody here, when they've taken a trade and their trade moves into profit, they've moved their stop to break even or trailed their stop underneath the trade? Has anyone ever done that? Okay, so Janelle, 
Nadir, great. So some of you guys have done that. Those of you that done it, how many of you have tested whether or not it's the optimum thing to do? Most people just do it because they've heard it's a good thing to do. So let me show you something here, guys. If I have, if I have a trade come along and the trade goes into profit and I move my stop up and the trade stop, I move my stop up to my entry, the trade stops me out and goes on to be a three to one winner. So that trade, if I hadn't moved my stop, would have been a three to one winner. But because I moved my stop, it was a break even trade. Because it went into profit, I moved up my stop, it came down, stopped me out where I got in for zero, but went on to make three times my risk. Give me a yes if you're following me, guys. So if I'd left it where it was, it would have given me 3%, maybe even six, depending on what I'm risking. Now let's say that happens again. You move your stop, you end up with a break even trade. The trade made it to three to one. Same thing happens again. You move your stop to zero. You have another break even trade. You haven't lost anything, but that trade goes on and makes it to three to one. Then the fourth trade comes along, triggers you in. And before you get a chance to move your stop, the trade is a loser. Can everyone see that? In both those scenarios, both traders have got a minus one. Then the same thing happens again, comes down, stops you out on the next trade. That trade has got minus one and you've got minus one. Now, if we look at the result at the end of those five trades, that trader is plus seven. Can everybody see that? Whereas this trader is minus two. So what people think is they think that by moving their stop up to break even, they're protecting themselves. They're only protecting themselves if they know that over a long period of time, that's why. In fact, some of your protection on your trade are your winners. Can everybody see that? So be wary of moving your stops too soon. Make sure you know all of our strategies are tested. For example, one of the strategies that I've tested that is the same as this is a three to one. If I move my stop at one for one, when it reaches one for one, if I move it to break even, what happens in that scenario is the strategy becomes unprofitable. But if I wait to two to one before I move my stop, it actually gives me a better result than just leaving it there. But the only reason I know that is because I've tested it. So either test it yourself or find somebody who's already tested it. Good. And this is something where most traders go wrong. Most traders are aiming for a too small a win. Your minimum risk to reward is one for one. Every single one of our strategies has a greater than one for one. Our average across the board is a two point six to one risk to reward. That means for whatever I risk, whether it's a hundred pounds, 200 pounds, 500 pounds, what I bring home is 2.6 times that amount. And that's a cross board with our strategies. Too many traders are risking or, 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 or on their winning trades are taking the same amount out of that trade as they risked, which means they have to have more than half of their trades win. I made 68.8% last year and my win loss ratio was 50 50. Which means I only won on 50 trades, but when I won, I won three times what I lost. So much about risk management is making sure that you do that. So can everybody see, I pulled some chart trades up from before and I'm gonna, I've shown you a recent trade, I'll show you some more recent ones. Look, can everybody see, look, this is one trade here, all right? It's split in half, but this is one trade. So what do I take there? 330, that trade there, you can see it, 486. These were break evens, these were break evens. But when you look at my losses, are my losses smaller than my wins? Yes or no? 
That was one trade split in half. Can you see that there? All my losses are smaller than my wins. I'll show you another one. See it there. That is one trade, 437. That there, 200. Can you see? So it's so important that you bring this into your trading. And when you lose, excuse my language, don't lose your... Too many traders get too upset when they lose. Now, I want to show you something. How many of you have ever had a losing week or a losing month as a trader? It's part of it. Any, born, any guru that tells you you don't lose or that you win 90% of the time, all the time, is lying to you. Look, this was October last year. Okay? Can everybody see? Look, loser, 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 loser. That's one trade. Can you see that there? One, two, three, four, five. Six losing trades, two break even, and only two winners. Yet by the end of the month, I had six losers. These are on swings. This is a bad month for me. Six losers, two break even, two winners, and I was only down by about 50 pounds on an account with six figures on it. Can everybody see how powerful risk to reward is? Because look at the size, simple, can you see the size of my winners massively outstrips my losers? Can everyone see that? Good. Okay, so now off the back of risk, Have we got any questions? So we'll come to questions. I'm just going to pull question, a question slide up now. So we'll come to questions. So fire your questions in. And I'll come back to that next bit in a second. So has anyone got any questions? I'll come back on the video. Good. So, Peter, how can you break even if you are exiting only stop losses or targets? How Are you meaning how can you break even on a trade? Is that what you're asking? Brilliant. So, the way you break even on a trade is, if I go back to that previous example that I've just shown you. So, if price comes up, pulls back, and I enter here, and my target is here and my stop is here, okay? So if the trade goes against me, or remind me, what's the maximum risk I can take on the trade? It's 2%, isn't it? So if this trade was to go against me and hit my stop, I would lose 2% maximum if I'm a swing trader, 1% if I'm a day trader. So in that scenario, if price goes in my direction, Peter, I am showing profit in my account. So at that point, let's say 200, and it goes up further, I'm showing 400. Okay, but that isn't profit that I've banked. Give me a yes if you're following, Peter. So I haven't actually taken the trade off the table. If I then move my stop based on a set of rules, if I move my stop, and my stop is now at my entry. Does that make sense? If price was to come back from this point and hit this level, I would lose nothing on the trade minus any commissions or swap fees. So it would be a break even trade. Does that make sense now? Great stuff. Um, next question, what is the best risk to reward? Or, or Shah, do you want to jump in after this one so you can keep... Uh, yeah. So I, the, yeah, best, you go ahead. the best risk to reward. There isn't one best risk to reward. 
Okay, so there isn't one best reward. What it comes back to is you have to test. Mercia, does that make sense? So when I, the strategies that I traded, when I first started trading them, I didn't know. But what I would do, and I'll show you this on a sheet. So you can, so just bear with me a second, because this I think is really important. So, and it can change. Does that make sense as well? So over time, market conditions mean it changes. But what you'll notice here is any of the trade strategies that we trade, when we test it or take the notes live, can you see that we test different risk to rewards? Can you see that there? And then what I can do is I can change that risk to reward because I, I track what's called the maximum exit. And then what that does is I can compare different risk to rewards on our spreadsheet to work out which one is optimum for that strategy. All right, so there isn't a best one, but the rule I want you to stick to is no less than one for one. All right, good. Okay, so I'm going to take in uh, th just only three questions and then we're going to move on to the next segment. And uh, one of the questions is the analyzer software that you use is Trend Trader? Question mark. And okay. Sorry, just repeat the question, sorry, is what, what software? The analyzer software that you use. I use, yeah, the charting software that I use is called Pro Real Time. So they are a French-based company. Their data is very uh, secure. The system's very easy to use. Uh, the ones that we suggest are um, uh, uh, Pro Real Time. Uh, E-Signal is very good, but very expensive. Another good one is Trading View. Um, we go for set charting softwares that are simple to use. So trading view is another good one. And uh, often the broker's charts can be quite good as well. Um, we trade off of MT4 platforms, so it doesn't then matter so much which broker. Um, but we trade off MT4 and we will use, yeah, pro real time or trading view. Good. Okay, so what is the best way to set cut loss if we trade in small amount? Did we address that earlier? Um, what's the best way? Potentially, just what is the best way to... Set cut loss um, if we trade in small amount? My view is you shouldn't... Um, if you're trading a small amount, then your trade is always set up based on margin. So if you're trading a small account, then let's say you're trading with a thousand units of currency, which is a smaller size, then all that happens is that you will use a smaller lot size. So you still take the time to work out. I was doing this with a new student a couple of weeks ago. They're only, they've got more money, but they're starting with a small amount. They're starting with a thousand pounds. So their risk on the trade is 20, which means their lot size has to be very small. The only challenge is if the broker's minimum lot size takes you over the 2%. But you can still do it, and a lot of brokers will, bro um, will offer low lot sizes, micro lots and mini lots like InstaForex do, so it makes it easy to trade. Okay, so um, next question I have, this, uh, this is probably going to be the last question before we move okay. on to the next segment. When is the right time to enter a trade when it's going with a trend line, or do you wait for a support and resistance line? Okay, if I'm going to trade, when is the right time? The right time is always based on what criteria I have chosen. So if I'm trading with the trend, my criteria might be to get in when price tests a moving average and then closes in that direction. So again, there isn't one best time, but where a lot of traders will go wrong is they will see a market moving up and they will get in immediately because they're worried about missing out on the move. So they're like, ah, it's going away, it's going away. They, they were quite thinking maybe they should or they shouldn't. For me, if I'm gonna trade with the trend, price always has to make a move back down in some shape or form so that I can get a better price and so that I have the option to exit the trade subject to risk to reward without the trend having to continue. If there's clean air, then I will. But yeah, always make sure that price is on a short, on a long trade has come back down before you enter and then look for some repeatable evidence to get in. On a short trade, always look for price to move back up 
and look for some repeatable evidence to get in to the downside. Good. Okay, so thank you very much, Alistair. It's time for you to take a break, but uh, he's going to be coming back on for his part three very shortly. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much, Alistair, once again. I'll and, see you shortly. Uh, like, all right, I'll see you in a very short while. So in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the, one of the most interesting part of the evening where you stand a chance to walk away with great prizes. Now, uh, what are the prizes that we have in store for you? We've got a thousand USD trading bonus, two thousand USD trading bonus, and an iPhone to be won. And uh, to do us the honor for this segment of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite Mr. Pavel back on screen. Shah, uh, hi again. Hi. Uh, uh, dear audience, uh, let me somehow explain what, what's going to happen. So first of all, I will tell you about the prices. When I will tell you about the rules and then we will uh, proceed to the questions. So the prizes are the following. They are going to have bonus, a $1,000 bonus. And the good thing about this bonus is that you don't have to trade off uh, the profit. So whenever you make a profit, you can withdraw it without any limitation. That's why it's so good. The, the, and this is kind of third price. The second best price is 2,000 uh, US dollar bonus, the same conditions. So whenever you make profit, you may, you may, you may do withdrawal and that's uh, no conditions for trading. How many lots do they have to trade? Nothing. So not quite, quite a nice, nice price. And the first price is the iPhone. Uh, so the, uh, that might take time because nobody knows from what uh, country our winner will be. So, but anyway, the thing is, so we will find you. So first of all, make sure you write uh, your, uh, when I ask a question, you write your answer in chat and make sure you write it to everyone, not just to panelists, but to all, to, to, to all the participants. Yeah, for example, I see uh, Nico van der Waal and you are writing to panelists, don't do that in, in, in case you want to win the prize, make sure you write to everyone. So, uh, so I guess, uh, it, guys, is every, can you please write in the chat if ev everything is clear with the prizes? So I ask the question, you uh, write your answer in chat for, and you will have like one, one or two minutes Thank you. Uh, uh, one, one or two minutes. If for two minutes nobody gives the right answer, it stays with me. So make sure you gave, give the right answer. Uh, and the, the person who will give the right answer, I will comment you in, in chat. So, so uh, I, I, I will make a comment that while well, we have a winner, so uh, me and Shah, Shah also knows the right answers. Hope he's not going to give them. Uh, so okay. we will watch and, and make sure uh, give it too. <laughs> okay, so now let me let, let me move to the question side. Let me uh, so some people prefer uh, to hear, some people prefer visual content. So what we are going to do is uh, I will ask questions and I also show it on my screen. So let me give the demonstration of, uh, of the screen. Just give me just a second. Uh, yeah. Here it goes. Uh, so, uh, so before, uh, before, uh, before the real questions, let me explain how it works. So I'm going to read you the, uh, the question, uh, but uh, there will be, besides the question, there will be a picture, which will be a hint and before we do this, let me give you an example. All the questions will be related to trading, but the example is not related. So please do not answer for the example. This is just for you to understand. So here is the example. We have a question. How many football uh, World Cups does Ur Uruguay have? Uh, there are two ways to answer this question. The first uh, way is actually if you are football fans, maybe you know that in 1930 and 1950 Uruguay has won, so the answer is two. The second, the sec, if you don't know, you can take a look at the picture and you can see the band, the legendary Irish band U2, 
So in the name of the band, there is a, uh, the, 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 there is a figure two, which is a hint for the right answer. So guys, if the example is clear, uh, please uh, give your feedback in chat if the example is clear. Uh, Shaw, at the moment, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot see the feedback. So can you please uh, confirm if, the, if everything is clear and if we get, yes, get the feedback? Yes, everything is very clear right here. Sorry? Everything is very clear over here. Fantastic. So, uh, so we are coming to the first question. The first question is for $1,000 bonus. So the technical analysis is a method of forecasting of price movement based on the study of past market data. So this uh, actually, which is what Alistair has told us. So market data is mainly based on price and what? Okay, now I have to go to chat and try to see if we have the right answer. You have um, demand, action, time, 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 time. No, news, time, no, no. News. Please take, please take a look at, at the pick. Yeah, and they have the winner. They have the winner, and, and I guess nobody was earlier than Diego Rubio. Yeah, uh, Shah, do, do you confirm he was the first one? Oh, Diego, uh, Diego wrote to us. Yeah, so in, in, instead of instead of writing to everyone. Everything is going like so fast on my screen right now. So let me just scroll it down. So uh, I, I, I guess the first right, right answer, which is volume, and you can see the picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the first, yes. the first uh, who, 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 who was it? I guess it was Marcelino. It's Diego Rubio. But, uh, but as far as I see, Diego Rubio wrote only to us, not, not only to panelists, not to uh, all people. And I actually told many times that it has to be to, to all. Uh, Shah, can you please confirm? Uh, yes, uh, you're actually right. Diego actually wrote to all panelists and uh, we have already informed everyone to write to all panelists and attendees. So the next one that wrote volume is NS. His, that's his uh, initial, I guess. Okay. Uh, okay, so, that, so that's how it goes. So we had the winner for the first prize. And now, the, so the question was very easy because you can see the picture was somehow very evident. And now we are going to have the second question for, uh, for $2,000 bonus, and which will be a bit more complicated. So maybe guys, you remember the movie Big Short with Ryan Reynolds, Brad Pitt, Christian Bale, probably the best movie on financial market. And they have actually, in this, uh, the protagonist, the main hero, created a new in financial instrument to earn on the future collapse of American mortgage market. It's called credit default, and you need to tell me the last word. And this picture can actually help you to guess it. Oh, yes, they have the answer. There are so many right answers. Shah, can you help to trace the first? The swap, 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 and the first one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So many right is answers. Is Marcin? Marcel, my congratulations. That was that was great. We will contact you after the webinar. And finally, they have the uh, most difficult question for the iPhone, and <clears throat> and there will be actually two questions in one. So you you have to give full answer to both parts of the questions. So let, let me show you, let, let me show you and explain. So, sorry. So here it is. Uh, famous uh, Russian uh, Forex analyst Nikolai Ivchenko says that there are situations when making money on US dollar is very easy. And this strategy worked for him uh, in 2003, in 2001, but the first time he noticed this in the beginning of 1991. So what happened in the beginning of 1991? And, and if we go back to this 1991, should, should we buy or sell, or, or sell dollar? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, should we buy or sell dollar in such situations? So two, uh, so two answers. What happened and buy or sell. So only the full answer gives uh, the price. Okay, looking at the chat. We have a no, no, sale. no. Please take a look at the spot. picture. Uh, what, what happened? The picture is actually... You guys, you, you, you guys still have one minute and 45 seconds. 
Yeah, they have the dessert here, but it's hints for something. No, no, it's not a cake, Alex. <laughs> That's the kind of indirect hint. Maybe you remember the history. So what happened in the beginning of 1991? Sweet cell. No, no, no. Uh, so, well, you, 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 no, not sweet cell. Uh, so you need to tell what happened. Maybe you remember the history. No, it has nothing to do. The dessert is actually, yeah, you have a lot of desserts and that's actually the hint. But to some, to some uh, very important uh, event in the history of 90s. No, it wasn't USSR collapse. The USSR collapse uh, happened in uh, the end of 1991. So that actually happened before. Guys, you have one minute. In case, in case there is no right answer, I will, I, I will, I, I will, I will have the iPhone with me. So it yep. is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the right answer, but it's not full. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex, great stuff. Now, but now buy or sell. Uh, no, there is no right answer yet. But Alex, yes, we have Alex who is uh, who gave the right answer. So let me. Alex, you are still on time. You still had the 15 seconds. So my congratulations. Uh, so what actually happened? So Nikolai Ivchenko uh, found out that no matter when uh, U uh, U.S. Army starts some invasion, for instance, in 2003 there, there was Iraq, in 2001 there was Afghanistan, and finally the Operation Desert Storm. Yeah, it's storm and desert. So uh, there are two meanings of the word desert. Uh, First is actually something you can eat, and second is actually what you have in in North Africa, in in Gulf area, wherever. So that was a hint to desert storm. I know it's not really easy, but that's the hardest question. So you had to be very smart. And what is surprisingly, people tend to think when then America bombs something that works for the uh, growth of dollar. But surprisingly, if you go back to history and look in charts, you will see that actually dollar goes down and the reason is uh, simple because instead of uh, spending money to economy the uh, government spends uh, money to army that's really really expensive adventure so at least for the first stage of the uh, the you, you need to wait and look at the uh, and in the beginning, dollar always goes down. If you if you go to nineteen I think there's been uh, some a little bit of technical issues along the way. Is everyone still here online? Uh, as far as I understand... Okay, we lost we you for a minute there. We, we lost you for a minute there, uh, Pavel. Uh, uh, so I was lost. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. So, was, shall, was, was, anyway, that doesn't really matter. I was, uh, I was talking about the interesting story. Why should we sell? But anyway, uh, they, they, they have the winner. So we will find you after the webinar, we will contact you and make sure you get your prizes. But I guess that's all from me. Thank you very much, Pavel. And also congratulations to all our winners. And uh, we're gonna move on to the next segment. We're gonna bring back Alista online for his uh, part three of his talk. So Alista, take it away. Thank you, good stuff. Right, let's get the slides back on. Just give me a couple of seconds. So we're coming in to the last section and probably the most important section that we will cover today. So I'm just gonna get the slides up, okay? So this is the last section that we're gonna cover. So. Perfect, right, I am all good to go. So we are gonna now talk about developing a bulletproof mindset, 
Okay, now this is something that I spend a lot of time working on with my traders in the room. Uh, this is a, a, something that I feel that is so important because if a trader's mindset is not correct, there is no amount of um, there's no amount of work that or no amount of strategy that can help. Now, how many of you here that have traded have felt bad about a losing trade? So how many of you, whenever you've, if you've had a losing trade, you feel, you feel bad about it? Yeah, you don't feel good. It's natural for us to want to win. Would everybody agree? Yeah. So that's really that's a really 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 important thing to understand. So one of the things that that stops traders moving forward is a lot of traders think they've got to have a perfect mindset, as in they've got to be almost almost robotic and not feel those emotions. And this is where a lot of traders go wrong because when they feel um, feel bad for losing and feel great for winning, they know that they necessarily shouldn't do that. So what I'm going to show you here is how to train your mind to be less attached to your winners and losers. How many of you would like that? So that you can be less attached. You will still feel some emotion, but you will be less attached to your winners and losers. How many of you like me to do that? Or you be able to walk away with some key things? Good. So the first and most important thing is we're going to look at some tools, but we're going to have some understanding first. So the most important thing to understand is that your brain works on a concept that it says on the top left of your screen. Okay. It's the concept is what's called recency bias. Okay. Just give me a yes if you can see that on the screen and you can see the two people. Good. So what recency bias basically means is you are much more likely, as it says there, to think about or be emotionally affected by the trades that you had more recently and forget about the trades two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago. OK, so. Knowing this is extremely important because if you know that you're naturally more likely to think short term, think about how our, our society is set up. Think about how easily we can get something and how quickly we can get something when we want it. So this natural feeling and emotion that you feel relative to what is happening now is inbuilt into your DNA, but it is also reinforced by the fact that we get things so quickly these days. So just knowing that is puts you ahead of most traders because most traders are reacting emotionally to the last couple of trades where you as a trader need to be thinking about this in a completely different way and focusing number one on making sure that if you feel an emotion based on the last couple of trades, number one thing to do is just simply acknowledge the fact that you are suffering and you are coming, you are feeling what is called recency bias. And I've worked with traders that say just remembering that it's natural for them to do that means they feel it less. So it's a really, really important thing to bear in mind. Now, most traders fall into two categories in terms of what they do and how they react to trades. Okay. The two categories are overtrading and undertrading. All right. So you have overtraders and you tend to have undertraders. Okay. Overtraders, I want you to have a guess. Do you think they tend to be more fear based? So overtraders are trading more and their trade frequency is higher. Do you think they basically trade on greed or fear? Well, it says it there. They focus much more on greed. Okay. Now I'm working with a gentleman right now in our trading room who is an over trader. He suffers from greed. So 
we are working very closely to reduce the number of trades he takes. Now, if a over trader has a series of losing trades, what do you think they're likely to do? Walk away and go and reanalyze or try and win the money back? Do you think they're trying to, they're going to walk away guys or try and win the money back? Which do you think? Are they likely to walk away or win, try and win the money back? Win the money back. Brilliant. Yeah. Whereas the under trader tends to be more fear based. They'll probably have a lower volume of trades. So if they have a losing run, which again is natural, are they likely to try and win the money back or do they walk away? Do you think and reanalyze? Do you think they walk away and reanalyze or try and win the money back? Reanalyze, brilliant. So they're going to focus on, yes, reanalyzing. But it's not as simple as that. So one of the things that I do is I get all of my new trading room students to go through a 50 point questionnaire. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to get you to go through that right now. But what I'm going to do is talk about the four personality styles that impact you as a trader. Okay. So we're going to talk about these four personality styles because most people and this is what I want you to make a note of most people have what is called a primary personality style okay so most traders have what is called a primary personality style okay now nobody is one thing and what happens in the market and the results you're having and lots of other factors will impact it but there is a primary personality style that I want you to consider. So I'm going to explain each of these and then you can start to have an idea of where you think you will be. But there is a really, really important thing to consider here. And that is that there isn't a right or wrong personality style. Different people react and respond in different ways. All right. So I'm going to talk first of all about these people on the left. These are called drivers. Now, as I've said, we have a primary personality style, but there are characteristics based on where you are here. Okay. So the guys on the left hand side tend to be more fast paced. Okay. So they tend to talk faster, think faster. They tend to be quicker. They tend to be more impatient. Both these ones and these guys down at the bottom. Whereas the guys on the right hand side tend to be a bit more slower paced, a little bit more considerate, will be a little bit slower in their decision making. Okay. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but they just do things a bit slower. The guys above, so here and here, tend to be more internally motivated. So they're less focused on what others tell them. Where is the guys below the line? These tend to be slightly more externally motivated. Now, some of you might be listening to this and think, how does this apply to my trading? Well, stick around and wait because you will see why this is so important. So drivers, fast paced. Drivers love to win. Now, how we all like to win on trades. Everybody likes to win. But drivers, winning is really, really important to them. You probably know somebody in your family or a friend who they want to win at everything. So they love to win. So they love to win, but they hate. They absolutely hate losing. So losing is something that they really, really hate. So as a trader, if you're going to have a strategy that has got a three to one, like we were talking about earlier, risk to reward ratio, but it only wins 60% of the time. It means 40 of your trades are going to be losers. Do you think drivers like having 40 losing trades? No, they hate it. 
So drivers, when they lose because they love to win, they are much more likely to be greed-based traders and they are much more likely to overtrade and they are much more likely to increase past the 2%. But those things usually only happen if they hit a losing run. These are the guys that are really good at starting. These are the guys that when I'm, when I'm telling them about my products and services, they don't even need to hear it. They've already decided they want to do it. They're in. But what they need sometimes is the reins pulling in. They often need to slow down a little bit because losing trades will cause them to go into greed mode, over trade and over risk. Whereas over here on the left hand side, the analytical guys, they're much slower paced. They focus more and they love being right. Now, as I said, you may have friends or family or you might know someone that loves being right. Okay. What do you think they, if they love being right, what do you think they hate? What do you think they hate? They hate being wrong. So if the trade loses, they see it as the trade being wrong, all right? They hate being wrong. If, if they're wrong, okay, what happens is they tend to go into a more fearful mode because they are the ones that will analyze multiple strategies before they make a decision. They will be the ones that will overlook and overlook and overlook. And when a trade's going wrong, they tend to go into a fear state. They're more likely to under trade and either lower their risk or walk away or try and fix the strategy. And very often, because everybody is, remember, short-term biased, so everybody has a short-term bias regardless of personality, very often what you'll find is they jump from strategy to strategy. They have a couple of losers and they change it. They're constantly trying to find the right indicator. Can anybody relate to that? Whereas these guys will just try and out trade the market. They will probably have less indicators, less strategy. They'll just try and out trade it. They'll try and beat the market. So the challenge here is these guys will often, if they hit a losing run, will move away from the trades, will pull inwards. These guys over here, the expressives, what are they like? Well, the expressives, these guys, very externally motivated, they love, absolutely love having fun. So they like having fun. They love variety. Guess what they hate? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Well, anyone want to say what they think they don't like? So they love having fun. They love being right. What do you think they don't like? Brilliant, Herbert. Yeah, so when things are boring. So if even if they're winning and they've got winning trades, what will often happen is if it's not very exciting, they get bored and they will make trades up. They will increase their risk just to make things more exciting. Or if the markets go quiet and they haven't got a lot of trade opportunities, they go and focus on something else like uh, building an internet business or property. And they very often have got lots of things going on all at once because they don't like focusing on one thing which means that they can miss out on a lot of trade opportunities because they are not focused on the market, all right? Lastly, over here, amiables. Now, amiables, and I don't know whether this phrase, um, um, the phrase we have in the UK is they like the status quo. They like things being the same, okay? So they like things being the same. And what they don't like, anyone want to tell me what you think they don't like? They don't like what? They don't like difference or change. Brilliant. Yeah. So they don't like difference or change. So what happens is even if they're losing, if, it's, if they're sort of loss, win, win, loss, loss, win, loss, win, loss, win, win, loss, win, win, loss, loss. If their trades are coming in like that, they tend to feel okay. But if they suddenly start having a good run, 
they tend to under trade because they get nervous because even though it's good, it's out of the ordinary compared to what's been happening before and they lose confidence. Same if the trades are losing, but amiable people, they lack confidence. So very often it's hard to get them to start. It's hard to get expressives to focus. It's hard to get drivers to stick to their rules. It's hard to get analyticals to stop fiddling and it's hard for amiables to get them to start. But actually, once they start, they make really, really good traders because what do you think they follow really well? And they're really good to coach. What do you think they're really good at following? Following orders, following the rules, yeah. Following instructions, they're consistent. So can everybody see here that each personality style has got strengths and weaknesses? Can everybody see that? So a driver will get started, won't be fearful about placing trades, will get on, will be competitive, will want to win. But if they start losing their weaknesses, they tend to overtrade. Analyticals, their weakness is they will overthink things. They will want too much evidence. They will try too many different strategies. They will worry about trying to compare one thing to another. But once things start going well, they're really good at keeping track of their results. And they're really good at keeping on top of their data. And you see that expressives um, start something very positive. They, can in, they enjoy learning, they, they get into it, but then if things go quiet, they get bored. And then amiables, the big weakness is they don't feel confident in starting. They don't think they've got enough confidence. They, they worry about things changing, but once they start, they follow the rules. So here's the thing. So Faisal, you've said it's best to keep in the center. What's the problem with theoretically thinking you can keep in the center? And I'll tell you, because that sounds really good in theory, but what's the problem with it? Why is it great in theory to keep in the center, but hard to do? Two things. It's not so people think it's the situation. It's primarily not the situation. This is the phrase that I want you to write down. As humans, our behaviors are learned. Yeah, they are learned behaviors. Please write that phrase down. They are learned behaviors. So if you are more driven, okay, even if you say, oh, I know I've got to calm down and not be as greedy, if the market conditions shift, then what the risk is in that scenario, you will go back to what your personality style is. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? So the way to think about it is this, is where it goes wrong is if you move into what is called an extreme based state. So an example of an extreme based state is when you are having a really good winning run or when you're having a losing run. Give me a yes if you're following me, guys. So the reason it goes wrong is your personality style is a learned behavior and do you le is it a learned behavior over a short period of time or a long period of time? It's a long period of time. So do you think you have to work hard to reduce that behavior, especially when you're in an extreme base state? Do you think you have to work hard? And here's the important bit. Very often, traders won't even realize they're doing it. So in a lot of cases, the trader doesn't even realize that they're doing it. So the important thing, remember, is to have, as I said first, not just have the awareness, number one, that you are a short-term thinking 
machine but also realize that when you get into an extreme state ask a simple question what is my primary personality style and what are the obvious this is what i want you to write down what are the obvious weaknesses that I, that may show up for me because if you know this ahead of time you are ahead of 80 percent of the traders that are out there because most traders are just concerned with whether they've had a winning or a losing trade that day so the awareness of your personality style and the obvious weaknesses be aware of those if you can start to see them then you can change what happens but if you can't see them then you can't change okay good so any questions on what i've covered here just on personality styles at this point are there any questions on what i've covered here Okay, we're going to start the Q&A. All clear on that? Excellent. Okay. So, um, I've got a question from uh, Nico. He say, is a take profit as important as a stop loss or is it better to manually pull out and check the market good question so the the simple rule Nico is this that every single trade you place you must have a stop on that trade okay so every single trade you place must have a stop and you must have a target now I say to all of my traders that these levels obviously a stop is the number one priority but all of my traders decide their entry rule and then their stop price and their target price. Well, I'm going to ask you, Nico, where do you think they do that? Do you think they do that once they're in the trade or before they're in the trade? Brilliant. So everything is decided beforehand. So, if you were asking me, is a stop more important than a target? Yes, because you always want to make sure that you, you protect your capital first. But defining your target is just as important because what a lot of traders will do, and have any of you experienced this? So you set yourself a target and price goes in your direction. Then the trade comes back down and then it's losing and then it goes up. And then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes up and it gets close to your target and then it comes down and then it does a lower high and you get out here and you get out early. Has anyone ever done that? Has anyone ever done that? Yeah. So the challenge is, is a lot of times people do that because they don't have a limit order in the trade. So for me, I always have a limit order because even the fact that you've got to go in and cancel that or override it, the fact that it's there, it makes it more solid. What I would suggest to you, Nico, is journal this. And then if you break your rules, journal the fact that you got out early. Because what a lot of traders will do, do you remember we've just been talking about thinking short term? So a lot of traders will break their rules five trades out of 10 but if you ask them how many times they broke their rules, they'd say, oh, one, one out of 10, one out of 20. So what they will end up doing is they'll, they'll, they'll lie to themselves. Can anyone, does anyone understand that? So they go, yeah, I break my rules a few times. Well, actually, you break your rules 50% of the time. But because you're not tracking it and you are not writing it down, you're not journaling, then that can be the issue. So one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk tonight is all my traders have a, a spreadsheet journal that you saw, but they also have a manual journal so they can track whether or not they're breaking the rules. And a really simple thing to do is take a big sheet of paper and just take that big sheet of paper 
And for every trade, if you stick to your rules, so you set your trade up, you define your levels and you stick to your rules, give yourself a green tick, even if the trade was a loser. But if you broke your rules, even if you had a winner, give yourself a red cross. And you'll be amazed by the end of a week, a month, a quarter, how many times traders break their rules, but they forget about it because they sweep it aside and then move on to the next thing. All right. Good. Next one. Okay. So um, uh, the next question I have, uh, we're going to do like five questions and uh, we're going to pick out the five questions Then we're going to move on to three questions that we have from Facebook. Now, the next question is, are you trading only price action or others like volume and footprints? Good. Uh, good question. I trade price action and I use levels and moving averages with that. And the only other indicator that I use is MACD because as a, a reversal trader, I use a lot of divergence. So I use MACD to track that divergence. And I've actually got a lot of stats that show that for reversal trades, using divergence improves the result. Now, some of my students as day traders use volume because we like volume. A couple of others use money flow, but predominantly we're focused heavily on price action. And the reason why is you can track price action and you can test price action and you know whether or not over time that works. Whereas things like news is very difficult to track. Things that are subjective like fundamentals are very difficult. So yeah, but what I say to my students is if you're gonna use something like MACD or volume or money flow is don't try and use all three because then what you end up with is an overcomplicated chart. And very often then you're looking for too many things to line up. So if you're gonna use something like MACD, um, money flow, RSI, some of my students use RSI, um, any of those volume, don't load up loads of indicators, okay? Okay, so the next question is, um, what real-time data do you use from the exchange? Order book, market depth, volumes? Doesn't that information provide market sites intent? It, yeah, good question. It does, but you have to be able to know whether it influences your trading results. So I, I've had traders that have come to me. I personally don't use order book and I don't use... Um, all of those different scenarios. I don't use the commitment of traders report, but a couple of my traders do. But when they come to me, if they say, Ali, I really want to get better at trading. I'm like, what do you use? And they say price action and the commitment of traders. I'll ask them, how is using the commitment of traders report or the order book helping your trading? Give me some data. And guess what? None of them ever can. So I'm not against those tools because you're saying surely they could help. If you're saying that, then, then you need to be able to tell me to what extent they help. I get the results that I want without using something like an order book. But my trader, Braden from the States, who joined us about two, two months ago, he looks, at, he looks at order flow. And I said, that's fine, but you've got to be able to show me, i.e. be able to show yourself that by using it, it has a positive benefit on your trades. So it comes back to testing. Okay, so um, do you think that price action traders can be successful like ATAS volume trader? Absolutely, yeah. As long as you have the discipline to stick to, number one, as I've just said in the last question, you have to know that what you're trading works. So one of the ways that I beat most traders is I've got more data on what I do. So it's not whether price action traders or volume traders, it's not, you're not competing. This is another massive illusion that is thrown around. So you saying can price action traders beat volume traders? So what? It doesn't matter. It's whether whatever you trade, can you prove that it works and can you deliver on it? And we have a really important phrase at Trader Support Club is, does your strategy work, number one, and number two, can you work it? Because you can have a great system, but if you can't work it, it doesn't matter. So it's not about price action versus volume. It's whatever system you use, have you got the data and can you deliver based on that? Okay, uh, so we're going to take one last question from the panel before we're going to move on to the Facebook questions. It says, yeah, since you mentioned divergence, is divergence at MACD at divergence at stock stochastic different? Different. Good question. Um, 
the concept is the same. So the concept of divergence, be it positive or negative, is the, is the same. The indicator is different. Where most people go wrong, whether they're using an RSI for divergence, MACD, or even a stochastics, is most traders will, will look for a weak divergence signal and classify it as divergence. For me, I need a very clear signal and the criteria around it is there has to be divergence coming into the level. So I won't trade simply off divergence, regardless of whether it's MACD, whether it's stochastics, doesn't matter what one it is. I won't trade just off a divergence signal. There has to be divergence coming into the level. So again, what I would say is if you're using stochastics to divergence, there's nothing wrong with that, but you must know that it works. I know that for me, using uh, MACD for divergence works, but that doesn't mean other indicators don't. So a really big piece of advice to all of you here is get out of this mindset of what is better and worse. It's a bit like being on a football team. You know, it's like, you know, Chelsea versus Arsenal. As a trader, you don't want to sit in one camp and think the other camp is bad or, or think that the way you, way you trade is the only way. A better question to ask is, is what you're using working for you? So to cast this, the principle's the same, but you must make sure that it works and you've tested it works. Okay, so uh, we had three questions from uh, Facebook earlier on this week. I'm going to address that. The question Brilliant. is, what, what are the mental obstacles a trader needs to go through, have sufficient practices in order to trade consistent, consistently? This is a brilliant question. So Kang, thank you for this question. This is a really good question. I've thought about this for the last, the last couple of days. So I would say what the mental obstacle number one, which we've talked about already, um, so make a note of this because you asked the question, is the, our natural tendency to think short term. So that influences too many traders is they change strategy, they over leverage and their personality style comes out based on the short term result. So you have to get good at thinking long term, but acting and placing trade short term. So that is like training a muscle. So you can't expect to do a 200 kilogram, kilogram bench press if you go into the gym first time. So training your mental muscle is a similar one. So the number one obstacle is training yourself to be less concerned with short-term processes. Um, it's to get used to having what we call, uh, well, what I call random distribution periods. So you may have a strategy that works 60% of the time and delivers an average 2.75 risk to reward. And that is a profitable strategy. And let's say, keeping it simple, you trade 100 setups in a year. You're going to have 40 losers. Now, sometimes win, win, loss, loss, win, loss, win, win, loss. And your 60-40 your ratio will play out maybe it might take all year for it to play out. And if it takes all year for it to play out, you might have a period where this happens. Loss, 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 win. That doesn't necessarily mean your strategy is wrong. You might have a period further on in the year where you get win, 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 loss. And then you start thinking your strategy is invincible and you're never going to make a mistake. When in fact, all this is, is the random distribution of the overall win-loss ratio that you have. And remember, if you've tested 100 trades or 200 trades or five years worth of data, and that is your, um, that is your uh, win-loss ratio, based on that risk to reward, then go back over the data and see when you had your best performing periods and what we call your worst performing periods and most number of losers in a row and most number of winners in a row. Now that may change going into the next year or next six months, but knowing that means you are better mentally prepared for when it comes. So one of the obstacles, however good a trader you are, and I, as I said, I trade with big accounts. I know guys that work at prop firms in London. I know traders from all different disciplines using different tools. All of us have winning runs and all of us have losing runs over a period of a year, over a period of two years. So if you know that is coming, then start preparing yourself for it. 
because that is the inevitable. And that isn't a skill issue. That's just part of trading. OK, I've known veteran traders who've made multi millions have a period of three months where they don't make a lot of money, but they don't walk away. They don't change their strategy. They keep an eye on their data and they move forward with it. All right. So that was a really good question. So number one, remember your short term. Number two, think about the fact that you are going to have periods of winners or losers and prepare for it and spend time thinking about your mindset and which personality style and be aware of what your strengths and weaknesses are. A good one here is to ask a partner because often they know more about you than you're willing to think about for yourself. So I would say that are the three key things. Okay, so uh, moving on to the second question. Okay, just bear in mind uh, right after this, Alista is going to pick out a winner for the best questions asked and uh, also not forgetting that if you are online, uh, please wave over to him when he mentions your name. Now that's coming on... Uh, after these next two questions, right? So um, the next question, the second question from Facebook is, how does Forex compare to other markets? Good question. Uh, so if you're talking about when you say compare, there's lots of mechanism by which you compare. Uh, if you were talking about, is it, is it harder to trade? Is it easier? Is it more profitable? Is it... Um, uh, is it, uh, does it offer more trades? Well, a lot of that comes down to money flow. So at the moment, I've, well, I've traded currencies for 18 years and I trade index futures and I trade commodities. Now at the moment, over the last couple of months, uh, currency sort of swing trades, there haven't been as extensive. So although we're only trading four or five indices, we've had more trades on the indices than we have and the commodities than we have on 40 currency pairs. So in terms of trade frequency, it fluctuates. So it's never the same all the time. But in terms of ease, if someone said to me, would you rather day trade or swing trade stocks or currencies? I would pick currencies every single time because what you don't get with currencies is you don't get gaps on charts. The trouble with intraday trading stocks is very often you'll get a gap between the close of the stock on a Wednesday and the open, which can play havoc with your stops, have it with slippage. So for me, currencies are simple. They're liquid markets. And yes, they can be susceptible to news, but they don't have an earnings period, which, which makes it a lot easier. So for me, it's not the only way, but compared to other markets, I think they're simpler. And the fact that they have a large amount of participants behind them means that levels work very well. Range bound currencies, as long as the range isn't too small, work really well for against the trend setups. And the nice thing is, is by also trading high level cross pairs, so things like Australia, Australia, Canadian dollar, New Zealand dollar CAD, Euro yen, you trade in cross pairs, you get lots of other opportunities. Whereas what I'm not going to do is go and hunt down stocks that could be affected by earnings or um, the MD leaving or, or, or whatever. So for me, I like the fact that they're big. I don't trade exotic currencies. I keep it to the major pairs, so the ones against the US dollar, and major cross pairs. So my watch list, I'll see if I can drag this across. You can see there that my watch list contains indices, some um, commodities, but it's mainly currency pairs because it gives me freedom and flexibility and they work very well in a recession. Okay, good. last final question from uh, Facebook is, what are the good indicators that you combine to use to double confirm the trend and prove the accuracy before entering the market? Okay, good. The only, the, the only thing on top of price action that I will use to uh, confirm a trend, so if I've got something like an upward trend, the only other thing that I will use, and it's, and for me, it's not, something that I use to say, right, that is now a trend. But what I will do is I will very often, if we're trending up, say on daily, I will look at our overall moving average position on the weekly. So I will look at something like a 50 moving average. I will look at where that is, where the uh, 21, so I use a 21. And the other thing that I do to look at trends and entries is I will use what's called moving average bands. So I use a five high and a five low moving average band. And what you'll notice is there's quite a nice statistical relevance here. If you look at these two, can everyone see if I got, 
if I get rid of these, can everyone see the two white bands here? So what you'll notice is when we're in a steep downward trend, price will spend 99.9% .9 of its time inside the band or below the band. And it's only very rarely that it comes out and very often it's only minimal. So the strength of the trend can be determined by where the price is. In the even in a, in a more choppy upward move, the majority of the price action is inside the bands or above it. So even when we're retracing, so having that as a statistical relevance helps me when I'm trading with the trend setups, even though that's not something I do a huge amount. But I use these bands to help with confirmations of trend changes as well. Trend lines can be good. Simple trend lines can be good to confirm trend changes. Great. Okay, now it's back to you to choose the winner for the trader course. Brilliant. So before I do that, we had one, we had a Facebook question that people chose. So I'm going to go to this one first and just answer this because some of you asked in the trading room, what are the three tips that my team should think that you guys should think about to you? So I'm just going to give you do these, then I'm going to announce the winner. So the first tip is this, guys. All of you, whatever you trade, this is what Kerry and Martin suggested is test, 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 record, record, record. So whatever it is you're going to trade, test it to make sure it has an edge and record it to make sure that over that period of time, that edge is still there. So test before you before and after you trade record. So that was number one. Next one. Number two, get really good at price analysis and only use a few two to three tools to do that. Don't overload your charts with lots of different indicators and lots of different things. Only have a minimal amount of information there. And in terms of trading, okay, make sure that you spend time every week. Think of it from a little and often perspective. Now, what I mean by that is make sure that you spend a little bit of time every weekend recording. Then spend regular times analyzing the overall market condition. And the thing that you should be doing the least of, believe it or not, is the actual placing of trades. The placing of trades takes up a very small period of time. Because if you've done this properly, and you've done this properly, this is the easy bit. All right. So they're the three tips from my other team that you guys asked for me. However, as Shah has said, we have a winner of my total trader package. Now, my total trader package essentially is our top flight package where you get access to all of our programs. You get access to all of our swing and our day trading strategies. But more importantly, you also get access to all of our live support. So we have a private Facebook group just for the total trader members. You can access me and the team on Telegram. We have uh, a coaching room with me nine hours a week, a coaching room with Martin for four, and a coaching room with Kerry, who takes care of all the day traders, for five sessions in a week. So you get about 20 hours of live support, and you get access to all of our strategy material and all of our training material, okay? So the winner of this one, okay? The winner of this one is Kang Z Yi, who asked the question, what are the mental obstacles a trader needs to go through to have sufficient practices in order to trade consistently? So you have our package. You have won our total trader package with that question. All right. So congratulations to you. What will happen is the show effects team will pass me your details. And what will happen off the back of that is you will be come part of our team. So I will be in touch and Sarah who will take care of you will be in touch and you'll have access to all of that material for six months. So that's free training and coaching from me and the team. All right. So uh, congratulations to the winner. So I'm going to leave it you off uh, with your closing speech, if you have any, and then I'm going to move on to the next segment. Good.
brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So one of the things I did want to say, however, is what we do have available for all of you is a free membership. Now, it doesn't include everything on the Total Trader. If that's something you want to do, you can get in touch with me once you're a free member. But if you head to this website, okay, so if you head to this website, okay, this is my website. And on there, what you will have is you will be able to access all of our free material. So some of what we've covered today, you can access that in more detail. I'm going to put this in here. So I'm going to paste that across now. So you have the link in here and I'll make sure that goes through to all attendees as well. So you've got that there. So if you go there and you go to the little sign up box that says start right now, if you fill in the details there, you can access some free material with me so you can learn more and more about that. Okay. So more and more about what we do. Now, you get your own dashboard. You can see there, you get access to some free training and you can also get access to some of our market review videos and the things that I put out for free to everyone in different parts of the world. So that is for everyone. Okay. That's for everyone. Now, I hope you understand that being a good trader is not simply about winning on trades. You have to be able to combine learning the theory, but learning in the real world. Now, one of my favorite traders, Paul Tudor Jones, said this back in 2008. And what he said here was, I see the younger generation being hampered by trying to know why everything happens in the market. And I've experienced this, and I know traders that I've coached have experienced this, where they want to know why something happened. When often what's more important is to analyze the data, track it, and then change their approach. There are a lot of people that overthink trading and use complicated terms. He says there, these days, there are many more deep intellectuals in the business. And with the amount of information that's available on the internet, it creates the illusion that there is an explanation for everything. But it's important that this last bit, the only way to learn how to trade during that last bit of a trade, so going from two to one to three to one, or hitting your target and staying in your trade till you reach that target is to do it. So remember, there is one has to experience both the elation and the fear. And I would add in here that you have to learn from that to be able to become a good trader. So thank you very much for today. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to speak to you. As I've said, there is free material there for all of you. We will be in touch with the winner very soon. So thank you, InstaForex. Don't forget that there's the opportunity with InstaForex to sign up. You've got a great broker with a great track record there. So thank you to Shah and thank you everyone. I've really enjoyed being here and I hope our paths will cross in the future. Fantastic. Great job, Alistair. It was a very great seminar. And uh, we really thank you for joining us for this time. All the best. Take care, guys. All the best. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it brings me great pleasure to bring back Pavel online to do the bonus link. Mr. Pavel, please. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, congratulations all for uh, for spending with, with us more than uh, more than almost three hours actually. So very short message. Uh, no, no matter if you are already customers of InstaForex or not, here 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 is here is the link of, for you in the chat. So you, if, if you ever want to, not ever, but if you want within the next month to make a deposit and try what actually uh, Alistair told you with us for uh, just fill in this form and we will uh, contact you and explain how to, um, uh, how, how to get the bonus and we will make, take care of it. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you for, be, th thank, thanks for uh, being with us and I, and thanks to Alistair for this incredible performance. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Oh, I'll be back on. All right. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, we're going to round this up and say good night to everyone. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us right here. Be safe, everybody, until we meet again. Good night.